that would be cool if we did a, it's like a sermon together. Because like he just preached on David and Goliath. And we would actually fit that prototype, okay? <laughs> but you know who he would be. So anyways, whatever. <laughs> Big Sam Powers. Hey, so we're, um, we're doing this new series called Connected. And uh, we, we're in week three of Connected where we're taking a look at this idea of what if all of life was really connected to Jesus? For some of you, that's a crazy thought. You're like, I don't even know who Jesus is. I mean, I think he maybe lived and, and, and he, I, he's dead probably and, and I don't know a ton about him. And, um, you know, so, so that might be a little bit of a stretch uh, for you. But that's okay. We just want to invite you to, to stay with us and kind of check out what, what it might be. Just keep exploring week to week to have all of life, like every moment, connected to this historical figure named Jesus. We believe that all of, all of the Bible, which you may be more familiar with than you are the person of Jesus, is actually connected to Jesus. So if this document is really all about one person, then maybe perhaps our life might be all about one person. And it might not even be us. <laughs> it might be somebody besides us, somebody different. Um, and we've been looking at how Jesus, uh, week one, was our better king, how we're all kind of longing for this higher power, this authority greater than ourselves to actually give us what we look for in different relationships and things like that. And, um, and so we said, hey, man, Jesus, Jesus just might be that guy. And then last week, Sam did a great job with David and Goliath uh, walking us through a better savior. Like, like Jesus, he just might be that better savior that you've always been longing for. Because we all look to saviors to, to functionally do things for us that we can't do ourselves. And I love how he, how he turned it into like, you're not, you're not David, you're the Israelites. I thought that was really cool. Uh, and, and this week, we're going to be looking at a better friend. That, that Jesus might just be that better friend that, uh, that you've longed for and uh, how he might fulfill a, a friendship that all of us were created uh, to be filled by Jesus. And so uh, we're excited to be walking through this. We're actually doing this because we're calling this series Connected. We're doing this in connection with our Avenue Kids. So Avenue Kids, they are doing the same uh, passages that we're doing. And, and so if you have a, a child in Avenue Kids, man, it would be awesome for you to maybe take some notes, take your outline, and then compare notes with them. You know, it, we'll, we'll probably end up in a few different places, but it's the same themes we're going through or the same passages. And it'd be a cool way for you guys to connect with your kids. Because here's the deal. We call this series Connected, A New Way to Live, because if, if it is all about Jesus, then that actually not only connects all of life to the better king and the better savior and the better friend, but it actually connects us in a way that maybe we've never realized before. It, it probably gives this idea of family a whole new meaning. And so we're, we're exploring what, not just how it is to be connected to uh, a better king and a better savior and a better friend, but how are we now connected to one another? And, and even going beyond that, how are, how's the greater church connected to one another as God's family? And so that's what we're going to be exploring uh, today. And, and if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Samuel. And if you don't, that's okay. We've got some stuff on the screen that will help you follow along. We also have an outline. And if you ever want a Bible, we'd love to give you a, a, a Bible. So it's on your way out. We've got free Bibles for you to take. And uh, if, that would, if that would be helpful for you during the week, I know it's always online. So you can get that too. Be, be, be free to look at your phone and not think that's going to be weird or offensive in here. Because I'm just going to assume you're on your Bible, even if you're in, like, Facebook or Instagram. So it's a win-win. I'm going to pray, and we're going to hop in. Father, thank you so much uh, for this morning. God, I just feel uh, your spirit telling me I can just trust you and, and walk in freedom. And so I pray that that becomes contagious to all who are with us today. Lord, we ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. All right. Yeah. So, hey, uh, a better way to live. Well, we've got to start with a better story, right? And so um, for us, what we've seen here is that the scriptures are, they're like one big story. It's not Old Testament with some stories randomly written. And then, and then Jesus, it's actually one story. And it go, it has got, it's got four chapters to it, creation, fall, redemption, renewal. Uh, and so we need to kind of place you in the story so you understand why, like kind of where we are. This, this would be like our GPS tracking system saying, this is where we are. Because before I start talking about this guy that maybe you've never heard before today named David or, or Jonathan, um, we should place him, like, where is he in the scripture and where is he in the history of the world? 
So we believe that God's writing a story. He's, he's this awesome author, right? And in the beginning, chapter 1 was creation. It's where he made all things, and he made them good. And there was no sin. There was no brokenness. There was no cancer. There was no shooting. There was no death. I just want to stop and pray for the uh, people who lost life uh, this weekend with the shooting in the, in the synagogue. And so as, as we speak of creation and what used to be, I'm reminded uh, unfortunately, of our realities. Let's just stop and pray for those who lost life. Father, we pray your comfort and your favor and just your gentle spirit to be upon those who uh, lost loved ones in that synagogue shooting. God, we know that you are close to the brokenhearted. So, Father, would you, uh, by the power of your Holy Spirit, make yourself known. Would you make the comfort of your hand and the warmth of your heart known to all who ache today and forevermore. And would you point them to Jesus in his great comfort that he offers. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So there was once a world um, that was without sin. And it had uh, a Hebrew word that I love called shalom. And it means peace. And so the, the chapter one was a world full of shalom and peace. And so there was peace between humanity, like horizontal peace. There wasn't strife, gossip. You know, there was peace between God and humans. So there was no sin that separated God. There was, God wasn't um, offended or there was, there, was, um, there was no sin that had come and uh, become a, a separating entity between God and humanity. And, and humanity had peace with creation. No hurricanes, no, no tornadoes, no, nothing that would take life or harm life. and um, it, was, it was a different place. There was even peace within people. There was no spirit that needed to be quieted because all the spirits were quiet in the Lord. Every, everything was working as it should. And then what happened was, um, if you're kind of familiar with, with Adam and Eve, maybe you believe they're a historical figure we do here. Maybe you just think they're kind of like, well, I don't know. I've always, I haven't given them much thought. Well, the scriptures teach that Adam and Eve actually um, had the ability to choose God and continue in this, um, in this way, in this relationship with God and with one another. But, but they were deceived by the evil one, by, by Satan, who came and said, hey, I know you have it good, but I've got a better way. I've got a better way. And so it wasn't like they inherently wanted to uh, bring havoc and harm and, and, and corrupt all of humanity. They just thought God was holding out on them, and they could find a better way. And so they tapped out. And, and what that did was it brought cosmic breakage and brokenness to all of us. It was, a, so sin entered the world because God is holy and just and, and real and living and offended by that choice. It was a choice that then separated humanity forever. There was a separation um, that they would experience in the garden where, where now we talk about God, but we're, we're not with him like, like they were in the garden. I love Jesus, and I, I have, a, like, this really awesome, cool, not perfect, but I, I love my relationship with Jesus, but I still, I don't, I'm not with him the way that I would have been with him in the garden. So there's, there's, there's all sorts of separation we now deal with because of sin, and, and some of the separation we experience now, some of the separation we'll experience in that day when we stand before a holy God, and we're like, yeah, we're in the line of Adam and Eve, and we really have no excuse for the, the sin and the selfishness that we chose and, and, God, you should bring a, a penalty to that because you're a holy and righteous judge, and the penalty should be eternal separation. Like, like hell and, and, and the wrath of God, those are real things. They're not just biblical concepts because God is a real living person. And so chapter 2 of this story is the fall, and that's, that's what we live in right now, and that's what the characters of our story today are going to be placed in. But, but there's a third chapter that we also live in. It's called Redemption. Where, where God in his love for us said, I'm not going to leave you as you've placed yourself. And I'm going to send one on your behalf. His name's Jesus. And on Jesus, I will place the sin of you. I'll place the sin of humanity on Jesus. And I will crush him in your place so that you can go free, so that you can be forgiven. So that I can extend my grace to you without compromising my holiness. If you will receive that by faith. And so the redemption chapter came with Jesus, and now Jesus comes after David and Jonathan, and so we're going to kind of place you in the story there. And then the final chapter is Jesus saying, I'm going to come back and renew all things. We haven't gotten there yet. So you and I, we live in chapter 3. 
Chapter 2 is still a reality. We, we still live in the fall and the brokenness, but, we, but we've experienced redemption if you're in Christ. If you've turned from your sin and yourself and you're like, man, I can't do this. Like, like Sam said yesterday or last week, I'm an Israelite in that army back in that scene, and I've got no answer for my sin problem, but I'm trusting Jesus and Jesus alone. Man, if that's you, if you've turned yourself over to Jesus like that, well, you've actually become a servant of Jesus, but you've become more free than you ever will imagine. And so you live in the, in the chapter of redemption. We're, we're all looking forward to restoration coming. The, the people that we're going to look at today, they didn't know about Jesus. They knew about a coming Messiah. They had heard word that there was someone, something coming to fix, to renew things, to make things right. But, but Jesus hadn't shown up on the scene. So this is way before Jesus. And, but they had heard. They, there, was, there was promises to come. And, and so we pick up the story here in, in 1 uh, Samuel where, where we're going to meet a few characters. And now I thought as an appropriate introduction, let me give you a current context for what this might look like. Are you familiar with a show called This Is Us? This is us. Okay, some of you. Okay, some of you. Um, and, and so I'm a, I'm a, this, a this is us fan. So I'm just going to like, like, for some of you, I discredited myself. That's fine. It's okay. Um, for others of you, it's like, oh, wow, that's really cool. So my wife and I, we have like this is us gatherings. Like, okay, did you watch the next one? Because if you did, you know, we're supposed to do that together. And anyways, the reason we like this is us is because it's high drama. It's high drama, and I, th I don't know this like, like um, psychologically. I'm just thinking it's high drama that's not actually my drama. So I can watch it from a safe distance and be like, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> you know, like, and, then, and then like eat my Doritos and go to bed. It's like, no, it's not a big deal for me. But I like, I'm like, I'm like into it. There's something about the drama that kind of like pulls me in. When I was coming up, the, the, the This Is Us was, was this little show called Beverly Hills 9021. Oh, <laughs> okay, another, you know, maybe I'm discrediting myself more. I don't know. It, that was a high drama, like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen this week. This is high drama, the scripture that we're about to enter into right now. I mean, there are some characters in here that are, it's, it's so let me get you there and, and we'll hop in. So you all know Goliath from, La if you weren't here, check out the message on, on, on our app. Um, Goliath was this big enemy that had, uh, come against God's people, and uh, David was this shepherd boy who fought Goliath and, and cut off his head. He went in there and he defeated the enemy. So that's, I mean, I don't know what you're facing today, but like we're talking literal enemies that were waiting to, to kill and, and like pillage you and your family. That's pretty serious, intense drama. And so uh, God had taken care of this one enemy and with this guy named David. Now, Saul was already the king, so you might be wondering, why didn't Saul take care of business? It's going to be kind of an issue in their relationship, okay? They're going to have a little bit of a complicated relationship, if you know the story, between Saul and David. Because when David comes in and does that, you know, Saul kind of likes it at the beginning, but then Saul's like, yo, you're stealing my fame. Like, I'm the king, and you're the shepherd boy, and they, they start to have some, like, serious issues, and, and then throw into this sort of Bermuda Triangle of drama, this guy named Jonathan. And Jonathan, stay with me, Jonathan is the son, the biological son of Saul, the current king. And yet he develops this beautiful relationship uh, with David. And what's really cool is that immediately after David slays the giant, it's like God gives him exactly what he needs. Let's check that out. So if you could um, throw up that scripture there uh, from 1 Samuel 18, 1. Now, I've, I've included this, I believe, on your outline. Th this is a, a story that has a lot of scripture to it. It's got a ton of verses. And so what you'll want to do this week is read through all of chapter um, uh, 1 Samuel 18, 19, 20. And then, and then I've got a little surprise tack on for you in 2 Samuel chapter 9. So th those should be in your outline. You're going to want to do that. I'm going to carry us through the story here with, with some scripture and then also some important things that happened along the way that I think we can learn from. And so we, we move into this, this first spot here in 1 Samuel um, uh, chapter chapter 18. And this is, this is right after uh, David has taken care of business and uh, he goes and he meets with Saul, and this is, this is how it reads. As soon as he, that's David, had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit 
to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. I want to take a second here and just kind of highlight some stuff. Um, I, this word captured me this week as I was like walking through it. Like, what does it mean to be knit to somebody else? To have your, have your soul knit to somebody else. And, and because that's, that's what was happening here between David and Jonathan. And, and it's not as though, you know, they, they like grew up together. It's not like this is coming after years and years and years of like, oh, Christmases and Easter's and, you know, I know those holidays weren't happening back then because Jesus hadn't come. But, you know, it's not like they weren't doing these sort of things on the regular. It's, it's like something God gives David. And what's really cool is David has this amazing measure of success and is about to roll in to the next level of who David is now, David is probably one of the most influential figures of the Old Testament. He's the person that everyone looks to, to not only bring Israel together, but to also bring this Messiah into the world. It's going to come through the line of David. So David is a super huge figure. And defeating Goliath is a really big moment in his personal story. What does God give David after this huge moment after this huge victory he gives him a friend May he gives him a friend that is knit to his soul and loves him as his own i think for uh, myself and i might include you uh, and maybe you can correct me as we walk through this message but i believe we probably underestimate the power of a friend I'm not talking about a ton of friends or a ton of acquaintances or a ton of people you kind of know by name or maybe even people you're in Bible studies with. I'm talking about friends. Friends who God gives you. You don't earn them. You don't work into them. God actually gives you friends. It appears at different seasons and places of your life to bring about his grace that you wouldn't have without them. David needed a Jonathan. He needed a friend. And what I wanted to do today is walk us through the story and, and walk us through what, what does it look like to have someone who would be knit to your soul? So what, what kind of friendship would this look like where somebody actually loved you as they loved um, themselves? And, and so we're just going to go ahead and, and pull up that list there, and there's... You know, basically um, a, a list that will, will take us through the story. It'll take us through the story of, of David and Jonathan. And then, and then we're going we're gonna to see kind of where that lands in our own life and how that points to Jesus. And so this is, this is some of the things that, you know, so I didn't really know how to title this list. I just went with, like, old school, I'm signing a yearbook, BFF. Okay, so this is kind of like what a biblical, divine, best, fan, best friend forever might look like. You probably sign this to a lot of people who are not this. It's to, it's, that's okay. You didn't understand. You didn't know what to look for. These are some of the things that come out of a, a, a friendship that is centered on the gospel, that is centered in grace. These are the, these are the qualities of a friendship that, that are like um, a, a gift from God to you. Now, before we start entering into this list, you have to understand there's two sides of a friendship, and neither of them are necessarily better than the other, but they both need one another. Now, stay with me for a second, because um, if, when I start going through this list, you might start thinking, man, I need to be more like Jonathan. But Jonathan couldn't be Jonathan without David. So some of you are going to be in relationships right now. Some of you are going to be in friendships where you play the role of Jonathan, not David. And some of you are going to be in relationships and friendships where you play the role of David, not Jonathan. Understanding who you are in that dynamic, understanding you might be more of the giver or you might be more of the receiver is a really big deal to God accomplishing his purposes in your friendships. You don't have to be both. David was David in this relationship, and Jonathan was Jonathan. Let's take a look at some of the, the things that came out of this um, relationship. And the first thing that we see is this idea of delight. Um, so 
it said that Jonathan, he, he, he delighted in David, and it didn't say why. It didn't say that it was because David was this awesome warrior. It didn't say because David was super funny, had popularity, had growing status, any of those things. It, it, um, as a matter of fact, all of those things would have been an, 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 like it would have been an obstacle to their relationship. Because let's not forget how um, Old Testament times work. If I'm the king, then the next king is my son. So Jonathan is in line for the throne. So if anything, if I'm Jonathan, literally, if I, if 44-year-old me, if I'm Jonathan, I am starting to feel threatened, angry, and fearful of David because he, he might compromise my power that's rightfully mine. But, but that's not what happens. The, the first thing that happens is um, Jonathan delights in David, and there's not a ton of reason given Besides, he just, like, chooses to. It's like a choice that he puts his affection on David. And then he makes a covenant. So the covenant comes out of the delight. So because there's delight um, from Jonathan to David, we don't even know how David felt about Jonathan at this point. We just know this from Jonathan's perspective. Jo uh, Jonathan makes a covenant. And a covenant is um, it's more than a contract, because a contract is something that you can get out of when it doesn't start working out right. A covenant... Well, th this is what marriage is supposed to be. A covenant is like till death do us part. It's like I'm going to give you the best of me regardless. That, that, a covenant is like, I mean, I'm in. I'm in. And so because of his delight in David, he covenants with David. He says like, man, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be here for you. Um, and that covenant, what does that covenant lead to? It leads to gifts. So um, in, this, in the story, as this keeps going on, we see that, um, you know, David and Jonathan are, are beginning this, this relationship. And one of the first things that, that Jonathan does for David is he gives him gifts. Um, it's, it's right there in, in, in chapter 18, just a few verses down from, from one. And um, you see that it says that Jonathan, he took off his robe and he took off his weapons and he gave it to David. And then wherever David went, David was successful. So early on in the relationship, it's like Jonathan saying, not only am I I'm going to be in this, not only am I going to be for you, but I'm going to give the best of what I have and who I am to you. Like, I'm going to go ahead and forsake the identity that I could lean into as the son's, or as the king's son, and I'm, I'm going to give all that I have to you so that you can go out and flourish. Like, your flourishing is going to be like my flourishing. Early on in the relationship, he gives him gifts. Early or throughout the relationship, next he, he gives him truth. So as I mentioned before, um, there begins to be some issues with uh, David and Saul. Okay, Saul's at the beginning. Saul was kind of cool with this, but then Saul starts to get jealous of David. People start singing songs about about Saul and David, and when they sing a song about. Um, about David, it's a ton of people that he's, like, killing. And when they sing that song about Saul, it's like, it's like the JV version of David. Well, that doesn't sit well with Saul, man. He's, like, he's, he's jealous. He's insecure. He's not, he's not too far off from me, man. So he's like, wait a minute. There's this younger shepherd boy coming in here, and I'm not sure I like that. And, and so Jonathan's obviously caught in a little bit of a, a tough place, right? So if my dad is getting upset with my my buddy over here, but he's wrong in how he's doing it, like my dad's heart's not in the right place, I'm still going to feel that tug of like, yeah, but he, that dude, he's my dad, you know, and, and you're my friend, and uh, you know, there's, there's going to be high drama. This is us. I told you. It's, I mean, it's, it's higher than any of the shows you can imagine. So what does Jonathan do? He, because of his delight in David, because of his covenant with David, he tells him some hard truth. And, and it's like, you know, Let's him, lets him in on some stuff that his dad wouldn't have, wouldn't have liked. Like, dad, you know, dad's not happy, and dad may come after you. And he, and he gives him an insight into things that David wouldn't fully know. Um, another portion of their uh, relationship as the story goes on throughout these chapters is ad advocacy. So not only does Jonathan speak difficult truth to his friend David, but he also becomes an advocate, one who speaks on behalf of David to Saul. Now, it's important that you understand um, this because here's the deal. 
if you wanted to speak, uh, or if you wanted to advocate to me for, uh, I don't know, somebody to come up in leadership in the church, you'd be like, okay, fine, yeah, let's meet, let's grab some coffee, and we'll talk about that person. There's no risk to it. But if you went before the king and it didn't go well, you could lose your life, even if you were the king's son, especially if you were taking enemy number one to the king and saying, no, this guy's good, dude. Like, you got to lay off, dad. I mean, this was not ad- advocacy that was free of charge. This cost Jonathan a lot to go and stand and speak good on behalf of his friend when everyone else around him was speaking poorly. Well, at least the leader was. What else? Flexibility. Um, so as this relationship's developing, you know, Saul's got some, Saul's got some issues, okay? So if, if you, you know, like, if you brought some issues in here, um, the Lord's working some issues out in me, you're, you're in a good place because God, God does wonderful work with people who, who have some issues. And he's the God of issues and he's the God of redemption. And so, so just so you know, you're welcome to invite yourself into this story. And, and so it's not just that, that um, Jonathan advocates for David, but then he becomes flexible because as, as Saul's kind of going back and forth, He's like, all right, David can stay. No, I'm going to try to kill him. And he actually throws a spear at David and tries to, and David must have been like this amazing, like, dodgeball player. I don't, doesn't say that specifically, but he's, he dodges the spear on more than one occasion. And, you know, Saul's a warrior and David's a warrior. So I'm sure it wasn't like, you know, somebody who didn't know what they were doing. So Saul goes from David can stay, David's my boy, to I'm going to pin him to the wall. So that's kind of the up and down, you know situation that David finds himself in, and, and in the midst of that, Jonathan, he thinks he knows what to do for some of it, and so he advocates for David, but then, as you keep reading the story, you're going to see that, that Jonathan kind of like makes this suggestion, and David's like, eh, I don't know if that's going to work, and, and so here's what Jonathan does. He's like, he's like, man, this is how I think I can help you, but I'm going to be flexible. I'm committed to whatever you need. You need me to be this, I'll be that. You need me to do that, I'll do that. There was this great flexibility that was in the relationship from Jonathan to David based on the needs of David. What else happened? Well, then there was sacrifice, right? And so, um, again, this kind of goes back to the advocacy thing. As, as the story goes on, the f- one of the first times, I think it's the first time that uh, Jonathan goes to his dad, it works out. It's cool. His dad's like, all right, you're right. I'm being crazy. But, but then as the story goes on, he actually becomes fully crazy. And he's like, no, you're not right. What's wrong with you? And he starts to turn on his, his own flesh and blood. He starts to, he starts to like um, look at Jonathan as an enemy. And so we see that there's sacrifice in the midst of this relationship that becomes apparent um, between Jonathan and David. And then we see there's a, there's a sending there's this really cool scene, right? And so, by the way, I'm, I'm walking you through this narrative of, of what happens between the two of them. And it's important that you guys read it, okay, this week because you're going to see these things. And, um, in the sending portion, th- there comes a point where uh, it, it looks like David probably shouldn't hang out with Saul anymore. You know, we have a, we have a course here called uh, Boundaries. And it's about healthy, godly boundaries. And it's, it's, it's helped so many people. You know, because there are times when a healthy, godly, consistent, loving boundary needs to be set up and a relationship needs to be separated. There needs to be like, nope, this isn't going to happen anymore. And so we see that in this particular case where it's like David is starting to realize, man, maybe I can't hang out around the palace anymore because he had been hanging out all this time. And so he and Jonathan have this deal where Jonathan's going to, going to kind of read his dad, and then he's going to come out, and he's going to signal David. And, and if it's all cool again, David can come back, and if it's not, David should go. And, and there's this really cool scene where it's not cool. Like, he's got to go. David's, he's got to go, or he's going to die here. And Jonathan goes out to David, and they weep, and, the, and, and they're, they're affectionate with one another. Like, like the knitting of the soul is it's a really beautiful scene. And, and here's, here's where it goes. He's like, you have to, you have to go. You have to go, and, and it's like Jonathan sends David. He, he doesn't push him away relationally, but he pushes him to the next right thing in following the God of redemption. And because of that, we see continuation. We see continuation in the story of redemption. David lives, David eventually becomes king, and Jesus Christ, the one that we said the story is all about, actually comes through the line of David, 
and had David stayed, had David not had Jonathan, if they're, like, you know, like, it, what, what would we be looking at? Of course, God is sovereign and would work all things, but, but like, the, the saving of David and David being who David, like, the continuation of the story came through this friendship. Now, let me just, let me just tell you, hey, there's, there's a couple of things that hopefully you've been kind of connecting with throughout the story. Hopefully you see some of these things in your relationships. But there, there are usually maybe a few relationships that you're saying, like, that actually defines the, the relationship that I have with this person. Um, or maybe it needs to define it more. Because I believe that for all of us, there will be different seasons when we serve as Jonathan, and we need to be this more for one or two people around us. I'm not talking about ten people. This was Jonathan and David, not Jonathan and David and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Adam and Eve. No, this was, you can't do this for a ton of people. You can be friends with a ton of people. You can disciple more than one person. But, but what I'm talking about here, this divine, this divine type friendship, this is like a one or two, maybe three type. I mean, this is my own opinion. I don't have scripture to back it up. But when you look at Jesus, he had 12, but then he had three and he also had one. You know, he kind of had, had a division of, of who he poured into. And so I'm talking about some of you might have that one or, one, or two, one or two people in your life, and you're sensing God saying, I need to be more Jonathan to that person. I need to covenant with them and, and, and say, I'm going to give the best of who I am to them. So this relationship is not going to be about me and what I'm getting out of this relationship anymore. It's going to be about them. It's going to be about them flourishing. I'm going to advocate for them when they speak poorly of themselves. I'm going to advocate for them when, when the community maybe speaks poorly of them. I'm going to be willing to sacrifice and be flexible, and, and I'm going to try to send them. I'm going to try to push them. Maybe some of you are here, and it's like, man, I'm, the, I'm on the David side. I know somebody's trying to do this for me, and I've been kind of resistant. I don't know if it's pride or you've been hurt before, and you're like, man, I can't let anybody that, that, that close. But if God's kind of doing that in your life, then you, you need to be obedient to that and be like, I'll be the David. I'll receive this stuff. I'll learn to receive somebody's delight in me. I'll learn to receive somebody speaking difficult truth to me. I'll learn to receive that somebody is giving the best of themselves so that I can flourish. I feel like in my own journey, I've been more on the side of, of David I, you know, I, I, have, I have a friend that, um, you know, he, he delights in me. And, he, and, I, and I, how do I know that? Um, well, on multiple occasions, he tells me, yeah, I was up early again, middle of the night or in the morning, I was just praying for you. Just praying for you. He's hospitable toward me in a way that I could never repay him toward me and toward my family. He speaks he speaks difficult and important truth to me over here, not to humiliate me or to, to make himself look, look better, but so that I and, and the church in the name of Jesus might flourish. He's been flexible. He's sacrificed. He not only sent me, but he came with me as one of the nine, brought his family. So I know what it means to receive as a David. And in and, and, I've, I've been in situations where I have another person that I'll talk about in just a minute that's, that's been that for me. And, and, and here's the deal. Like, it's godly to learn how to both receive and give in these relationships because Jesus just gets bigger to those around you as you do. And so um, here's, here's the question we're asking is like, okay, where does this kind of end? How does this continue? If you'll pull up Jonathan's quote, it's, it's scripture, but I put it as Jonathan's quote. And it says this, um, go in peace. This is Jonathan talking to David. Because we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord shall be between me and you and between my offspring and your offspring forever. So that's what Jonathan says. He's like, man, here's the deal. You, you got to go, but here, I want this covenant to be ongoing. I want this thing, even though this friendship, even though this season of the friendship is going to be over, I, 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 want, I want there to be legacy involved. And see, there's a couple of th awesome things that we could explore that come out of these type of friendships. One of them is, is this, this idea of legacy. And like, 
when you have a friend like this and you're involved in a relationship like this, it's never just about the two of you. It's like your marriage or it's like about the church. It's always about those in the context around you who begin to see and smell and taste the aroma of Christ. And so Jonathan, Jonathan sends him, and we're going to come, and this is, this is, in just a moment, this is where we're going to kind of end as, as, we, as we pivot here. But before we do that, we have to see how there's, in every story, a Christ connection, as our AC Kids uh, literature has it. It's how does this connect to Jesus? And, um, you know, it, it seems pretty clear that if you haven't realized this yet, you're probably longing for a better friend. So even though I, I have friends in this category, and even though I've experienced this, there's, it's not perfect. It actually, it actually pushes you toward the better friend, which is Jesus. And, and I love just kind of how the Lord was, was shaping this message. And he was like, so first of all, two things. You can't do any of these things for somebody else until you've received them. You can't give away what you don't have. And number two, the only person you can receive them from in a perfect manner is Jesus. So could you throw up that list again, please, Allie? And we're going to take a look at this list. Because I want to show you how Jesus has done this and is doing this for you right now as your better friend. Jesus, listen, Jesus delights in you because he chooses to, not because you've brought anything to the table. He knows he was there. Some of you are like, man, yeah, but does he know this? And what about that? If he knew, if he was actually, if he saw me do this to this person, he, listen, he was there, he saw, he knows, and he still chooses delight. That's how grace works. For those Jesus comes after and pursues, he chooses to delight even though he knows. Not because you have uh, achieved some varsity level, not because you're good for the team or the organization, not because you'd make a good ambassador of Christ. He just chooses because it delights him to delight in you. Jesus is the better friend because he's made a covenant with you. And what that means is like, man, he's, he said, I'm going to be the cross, his death and resurrection mean I'm in for good. Now you have to receive that by faith. You have to believe in that to activate that. You have to give yourself to that. But when you do, the covenant becomes binding. And it's like Jesus is saying, no matter what, no matter where you go, I'm in. And I'll actually find you and I'll pursue you. And that's why we love singing Reckless Love. Because it resonates with something in us that we know is true in Christ. That we have a God who will go where we will go and always give us more and better. And so he covenants with us. He also gives us these great gifts, right? He's like, man, here, here are some gifts that I want to give you. And so each of us have a spiritual gift, if not more than just one. And what we're supposed to do with those gifts is figure out how do we now use these to flourish, both for ourselves personally and, and for those around us. He's, he speaks difficult truth to us. The scripture is full of difficult truth. Truth that's like, hey, this is how you're living, but this is how God calls you to live. There's advocacy. There's, there's this um, uh, truth that when Jesus died, he, he rose again. He overcame your sin and he overcame your death. That's what the cross is all about. It's like the fact that because he died, now you don't have to. Not just because he died, but because he overcame it. And, and Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father. And Jesus advocates for you. It's not like Jesus isn't doing anything. It's not like his work is done. As a matter of fact, he said it is finished, which means the sacrifice is done. You don't need to continue sacrificing for your sin anymore. But Jesus' work is not done. He continues to advocate for you. When you speak poorly of yourself, when you believe lies, when others around you speak poorly of you, when the enemy comes and whispers you're not worthy, you should go back to how you're living. This isn't who you are. Jesus advocates for you. He speaks a better word on your behalf to the Father. He's ours. Look at me. Remember what I did. Obviously, we talked about his sacrifice. He then sends you. He sends you. He says, go. Take this, not just for yourself, but take it to those around you who need the same healing. And he continues the story. He continues the story through you. Sam talked about that last week. We have a role to play. He's continuing the redemptive story, creation, fall, redemption, renewal, through us. 
He has sent us and he's continuing his love story for humanity by us receiving it and then going and giving it to others. And so this points to your better friend, Jesus, friend of sinners. That's, that's one of my favorite titles that they gave Jesus, friend of sinners. He eats and hangs out with sinners. And I say I'm super happy about that because that means he gets to be my better friend because that's who I am. So as we close out, um, there's this question that it's kind of working through. Is who, who, who am I? Maria sang this song uh, today, and it, and it talked about um, I am who you say I am. And that, and that means that, like, because God says you're righteous in Christ, you're now righteous. Whoa. Should, should I keep going? Okay. All right. Whatever God says is true about you in Christ is true, actually, whether you believe it or not. Okay? So if you're in Christ, that means you have Christ's holiness. If you've trusted Christ as, as Lord and Savior and you've given yourself to Christ, that means you have the same righteousness that he has. And you traded your sin for his righteousness. That's the beauty of the exchange of the cross. So whether you get that fully or not, it's true of you. So as I think about this story, I'm thinking, man, well, who am I in this story? Should I, should I put all my effort in being Jonathan and try to be a better Jonathan? There's some value to that. What about David? Should I learn to receive these things more? Yeah, there's, there's, some, there's some truth in that. What about Saul? Don't be Saul. <laughs> there's no good in Saul. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean that, whatever. Just don't be Saul, okay? Um, but I don't think we got to who you are in the story. I don't think we got to who you are. I love it. I love it. And I have time to do it. This is great. Watch. Watch. Ready? Um, if you, uh, Allie, if you'll go to the next slide, it's going to show you who you are. Yeah, that's it. No, nope, go back to that scripture. It's in 2 Samuel. If you'll go back one, Allie. There it is, right there. There, there we are. Can anybody say that? I've been, I've been practicing all morning. I'm not lying. Because <laughs> I have a mic and I'm going to say it now. And, I, and I just, here's what I know. If I say it quick, I say it better. Mephibosheth. Whew. <laughs> Did it. Mephibosheth. You're Mephibosheth. I love this guy. He's one of like my favorite Old Testament characters. Well, what about David who killed the... What about, the, what about Jonathan? Man, he's such a good friend. No, 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 no. This is our role. Because remember that promise that Jonathan and David had? Jonathan's like, yo, the, the rest of the line that I have, I need you to be kind to them. I need you to be good to them. And so, and so Jonathan dies and, and Saul dies and David becomes king. And, and David goes on this search. And what he should have maybe done, if you were a typical t king in that era, was go on a search for the family of Jonathan and kill them all. Because they're a threat to your throne. They could, they could have an uprising that said, that throne belonged to us. And, and, and you, you got it. And we're going to take it back. It's our line. But here's what David does. He goes on a search and he's like, is there anyone else in the, in the family of Jonathan that's still out there? And they find this dude. His name's Mephibosheth. And, and he's, he's got these, it says he's got two lame feet. And in that, you don't want to have lame feet. You don't want to have lame anything in that culture. Not super hospitable to the lame and broken. And David's like, bring him here, dude. I got to see this guy. I got so Mephibosheth comes, and you can imagine, man, like he just kind of lamely brings himself in there. And he's before David. And he asks this question, man, like, what do you have to do with a dog like me? Like, what do you want? I'm not a threat to you, dude. You don't need to take me out. Just let me be. Here's what David says. Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. Mephibosheth, I'm going to say your name like I mean it. Mephibosheth, you get to eat at the table always for the rest of your life. Why? Because you're daddy. Because that relationship I had with your daddy, man, 
changed everything. I want us to know that we are Mephibosheth because a real godly divine friend shows you who you are and who your God is. We are the ones who come limping in after God has sought us. And many of us understand this, this uh, scene where you hear somebody like me say, you get to come to Jesus just how you are. And you're like, yo, you don't know the lameness that's been here. You don't understand the brokenness that I bring. And Jesus gets to say, Mephibosheth, you don't need to fear because of my relationship with the Father and what I've accomplished on your behalf. You can come and you can eat at my daddy's table forever. Lame feet and all. So what do we do with that? I think we get our minds around this idea that Jesus invites you to eat at the table in the midst of who you are. That you would just come and you would receive the grace you don't deserve because you don't deserve it. As a matter of fact, you can't come unless you understand that you are Mephibosheth. You see, if you walk up on the table of grace like, yo, I've been waiting. Like, how come you didn't call my name earlier? I put my reservation in. I've been at church. My family's been given. We've been doing, like, man, I don't know if you've ever been to a, a restaurant with somebody who can't wait, and then by the time they get seated, they're, like, angry at everyone. You come in angry at the table of grace, and it's like, oh, you, no, you, 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 can't, you can't come in like that. You got to come in like my, my feather shit. You got to come in understanding I don't deserve to be here. And as you limp and crawl and bring your nastiness in, then you hear the gentle voice of Jesus saying, you, you come and eat with me. That's who I want. Man, the second thing is, is not just staying at the table, but making room for other Mephibosheths at the table. You see, because we can't have these gospel relationships unless we, A, understand that we're Mephibosheth and that at the table with us are other Mephibosheths. So my lameness is going to look different than your lameness, but when we start to try to do the Jonathan David thing, check this out. I'm going to be like, trip. Oh, why do you keep tripping? Like, what, we, let's go on a run together. Okay, sure, trip. What, what's a, this is so slow. This is so messy. This is so, you actually trip into me and hurt me. Because I'm Mephibosheth, bro. I, I'm at the table, but I, I still have some lameness about me. And until we realize and make room for other Mephibosheths who's got different lameness than ours, man, we're never going to have these relationships. And the final thing of this, the final thing that he, that he would tell us in this moment is to go and get other Mephibosheths. Like the table is not full. It's not over. Jesus hasn't come back. And so the, 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 the sending of Jesus is to go out with the patience and the posture and the kindness of David being like, man, where are they? Where are they? There they are. I've been, I've been sent to, to speak a word to you in the midst of your lameness that you, man, you can come. Will you come with me? The table is not full yet. So I'm going to ask our prayer partners to come forward, and I'm going to close this in prayer. And just ask that the, the Spirit of God would, would meet you and encourage you, and call you by name, and tell you what to do with this. Prayer partners, if you'll come forward. Father, we come to you and... Some of us have been eating at your table for a while, but we forgot we were Mephibosheths. We forgot how we got here, and we forgot the fact that we still don't work perfect yet. I pray that you would remind us and you would encourage us that you're the God of Mephibosheths. You're the God who loves the lame. You came for the sick. Man, you're the doctor that we've always needed. 
God, I pray that you would not only allow us to enjoy the meal, but you would send us out filled from the Father with a passion to bring others. And God, if there are those here, man, they've never heard about a table like this. All the other tables they've come to, that they've had to earn it or they've had to keep it. I just pray right now, Spirit of God, would you fall upon them? And would they come forward in this moment to a prayer partner as Mephibosheth came into the table of David? And would they invite you in as the God who can do these things? Father, we love you. We worship you. Your Mephibosheth say, thank you, praise you, Jesus. We love who you are and who you are making us. Christ in your name, amen. Bless you guys, keep you, love you. See you next week. Everyone please stand with us as the Holy Spirit continues to minister.